Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Leslie presents. And now your host, Paul Leslie. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to welcome Richard Kerr. Well, thank you, Paul. It is a great honor to have you on. Well, thank you again. I think most stories are best from the beginning. What was life? Yeah. What was life like growing up? Hard question. Not a wonderful life for me early on. But I have always, from my very first memories, I remember my father singing me songs. What kind of songs? Probably songs you've never heard of, Paul. Little Man, You've Had a Busy Day, Old Faithful, songs like that. You're absolutely correct. I have not heard of those songs. (laughs) What, What type of songs are they? Well, Little Matt, they're actually very, very well-known songs, but they're of my father's era. I don't know how I would describe them. They're sort of, I guess, lullabies. I see. Old Faithful was about a horse that was a a firm favorite in the 40s. And I think the same applies to Little Man, You've Had a Busy Day. You can imagine what that song is about, a father singing to a son. What city were you born in? Bedford. 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 What kind of town is that? What's it like? Well, it's a Ford means river, and it, it's a town on a river, the Ooze. And I went to Bedford School, which was a privileged school to go to. It was a fee-paying school. And for the first uh, seven years or so, I um, did very well indeed. And then I realized that I probably had been learning everything parrot fashion. And for the next six years, I did, did terribly. Hmm. I always loved, we had a school, a school chapel there, and I was in the choir, and we all used to congregate there every Sunday, and of course at, at holidays, and especially at Christmas time, where I sang the solo in Once in Royal David City. So you had a talent for music from a very early age. Very early age, yes. I studied the clarinet, which is not much use as a songwriter. <laughs> It's the instrument Woody Allen plays. Woody Allen certainly does play that, yes, absolutely. My very favorite uh, clarinet of all time, well, I've now forgotten his name. It's terrible. I can't think of his name. Art, uh, no, no. Artie Shaw? Artie Shaw, Artie Shaw. I never could manage the concerto for clarinet in C. It uh, it was an incredibly complicated thing, but Artie Shaw had such a wonderful tone to his clarinet. In addition to, you just mentioned Artie Shaw. I was curious yeah. specifically about the popular music of the day that you were especially fond of. The first vinyl record I ever bought was Eddie Cochran's 20 Flight Rock. But I would have to say that growing up round about as a teenager, the first influence I ever had, although I didn't know I was ever going to be a songwriter, was Buddy Holly. I see. I remember going, we used to go to a place called Clacton-on-Sea, which is uh, not that far away from here, but I haven't been back since my youth. And I played All Shook Up by Elvis Presley till people must have driven people out of the place. You know, I I just could not stop playing that record. (laughs) You mentioned the clarinet. Yeah. What about the piano? How did that enter your life? It's a pretty boring little story, but I mean, very briefly, uh, there was a piano. Uh, when I left school, I went into the wine trade, very briefly. And I was living in a sort of a boarding house where in the main sitting room, which nobody ever went into, unbelievably, there was a grand piano. And myself and a friend who was also in the boarding house there, we just decided one day that we'd sit down and try and write some songs. And I've never had a piano lesson in my life, but we started hawking these little songs around our version of Tin Pan Alley in in Wardour Street in London. And eventually, publishers got interested. Tell us about the interest of the publishers. What was the songs specifically that caught their ear? Not songs that it would mean anything to you. I mean, I could throw out a few titles to you, but they wouldn't mean anything to you because they weren't his. Well, just tell us a few so we can look them up. Hard Loving was the first, I think the first single I, I put out as a recording artist, and Concrete Jungle, which sort of was almost, almost a hit. 
Interesting. Uh, it, it was played like a hit, but it didn't really feel that great. And I never dreamt that I could possibly ever make a living out of a song, being a songwriter. But as I say, I was in the wine trade at the time at a very posh store, which is still very much in existence now in London, called Fortnum & Mason. And Fortnum & Mason heard about the fact that I was recording as a, as they put it a rock and roll singer and they did not like the association of their store with rock and roll now we're going back a long time now because today it'd probably be a plus but in those days they didn't they sure as hell didn't like the association so they asked me to stop having their name associated with my record and I had the greatest publicist, a man named Les Perrin, who was a, was also the publicist for a slightly well-known group called the Rolling Stones <laughs> and David Bowie. And he said, it's too late, Richard. I can't, you know, all the, all the stuff has gone out to the, all the various people. I can't suddenly pull it back. And they, and in, in, in the end, the Portland Masons fired me. I see. And I was absolutely scared to death because, I mean, you know, I just, I had a steady job and I didn't dream I could be a songwriter or a recording artist or anything like that. But it was the one thing that pushed me into the music business. Well, tell us about the song Blue Eyes. Oh, Blue Eyes. Blue Eyes is, you don't know the term busker, do you, over there? One who plays on the street for... Yeah. 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 Yeah, a one-man band. Don Partridge was the man's name. And myself and my manager, Don Paul, were, we were queuing up to see the latest James Bond film in uh, Leicester Square. And this guy, Don Partridge, was busking outside of the cinema. And he had the most incredible coordination. And he was really good. And Don Paul said to me, I think I'm going to take that guy if he's if he let me, I think I'm going to take that guy into the recording studio. And in those days, it was all mono, no, not, not even stereo. And he took Don into the recording studio, and it cost him eight pounds to make a, a record called Rosie, which went to number three in the British charts. And Don Partridge could not write or couldn't find a follow-up that he liked, and he asked me if I would like to have a go and Blue Eyes was the result of that. I wrote that with Joan Maitland and that went to number two in the charts for twelve pounds it cost him because we put an upright bass on it for a half session. Mm. So twenty pounds and total costs a number three and a number two. Not bad. We had an interview recently with Scott English. He's a yes. man you wrote with. What was your first impression of Scott English? The entire exact opposite from me. <laughs> well, explain what that means. Very loud, from the Bronx, I believe it's the Bronx, and extremely loud man. I, I've always been a very quiet person, and which is not really very suited to the music business, but there you go. But I can't absolutely remember how we got together. I think it was probably, I think it was actually at a, some sort of music business function. And we, uh, I think we were just talking to one another and we just decided that we would uh, try and write something together. Uh, as simple as that. One of the songs that you wrote was entitled Brandy. Yep. Tell us about composing Brandy. I know that Scott's put out a whole load of his own explanations for the title of Brandy, but I never pay much attention to things like that when I'm presented with a lyric, because I think I was actually presented with the lyric of Brandy first. I think that the lyric came before the music. And I, I wrote to it almost in a sort of James Taylor style. I mean, I wasn't aware that I was writing in a James Taylor style, but almost in a James Taylor style. And, and we sat and we wrote that. I remember exactly where it was. It, it was in Curzon Street in, in Mayfair. We we could, Scott's electric piano wasn't working properly, and we had to go next door to his neighbor who had a, a sort of out-of-tune piano. And the song just came musically very, very quickly for me because I just related to the lyrics so, so clearly. 
The song later became entitled Mandy, as recorded by Barry Manilow. What did you think of Manilow's interpretation? Interesting. It's one of the first memories that I have had of going to Los Angeles. I was asked to go over by my publisher and Rondor, Rondor, which is A&M's publishing company, and I was waiting to see a man named Jeff Benjamin, who worked at Rondor, and outside the city, while sitting outside of his office door, I heard this song being played, and it took, genuinely took me, Paul, about a minute into it to realize that it was my song that was being played. Interesting. I couldn't actually determine, I mean, I, being behind the closed doors, as it were, I couldn't actually pick out the fact straight away that it was Mandy as opposed to Brandy that was being sung. But when I did find out, I, I, I was absolutely livid that someone had changed the title without asking us hmm. until I saw it zooming up the charts. <laughs> <laughs> when you think about it, I think Mandy is probably a much more accessible title than Brandy. Yeah. But Scott had had chart success in England with it himself as an artist, as Brandy. But anyhow, you know, Clive Davis, who decided to change the title of, of the song, in my mind, probably has the greatest ears, or he had the greatest ears of, of any record chief in the States. And he had that record, uh, Brandy, You're a Fine Girl by Looking Glass, which had been a recent number one for him on his uh, on CBS. And he just started up this new label, Arista. And Mandy was, in fact, I think the very first release on Arista. A lot of the songs you've written have been with Will Jennings, in my humble opinion, a brilliant lyricist. How did you meet Will Jennings? On that same trip over... I had been asked to sit down and write with a man named John Bettis. Yes, John uh, Bettis. John Bettis, at that time of Carpenter's fame. I traveled all the way over there, and I hate flying. I'm, I've got a, a tremendous fear of flying, always have done, still do. I pushed aside my fear and go on the big bird in the sky and come over to write with John Bettis. And, and he said, I'm awfully sorry, but I've got some rewrites to do for this new Carpenters album. So I thought, oh, well, that's okay. I can get some really good melodic things together on my own and wait for him. And the publisher over there said to me, I really would like you to look at some of these lyrics by a man named Will Jennings. And I said, his name was Lance Free. And I said to Lance, you know, Lance, I really, I understand what you're saying, but I really don't want to sit down with a lot of different people. I came over to write with John and I'd rather, and he said, now please just look at a few of Will's lyrics. When I looked at a few of Will's lyrics, he'd never had a hit at this stage. He'd just, just come over from Nashville himself. And I looked at some of these lyrics and I just thought, this is my sort of lyric, you know, that what he writes is from the heart. I can write with this guy. And so we decided to sit down and write together whilst I was waiting for John Bettis. Is that how most of your songs have come about? Is the lyric usually done first and then you compose the melody? No, in fact, the first song that Will and I wrote was a song called Somewhere in the Night. We were very fortunate enough to have several chart records on that, but never one what I call huge hit. Manlow recorded it and Helen Reddy and Yvonne Elliman, Kim Carnes and various other people. But I remember presenting the melody to him first on that one, the first song we wrote. I was staying at a place, a very infamous place called the Sunset Marquee, which is on Sunset Boulevard. And it was a, I rented this electric piano, which had three notes missing on it. But it didn't matter because it was such a great atmosphere at A&M Records, which is where my publisher was, the old Charlie Chaplin Studios. And it just if you couldn't write a, a hit song there, you couldn't write one anywhere. Well, what's your opinion of that song, Somewhere in the Night? I love the song. In my mind, it was about a particular lady, and it was, it was one of those melodies that came very quickly. And although it's, it's entered the charts on several occasions with Manilo and with Helen Reddy, and I never felt it's quite the closest that it came to in terms of feel was with an act that Clive Davis produced himself, an act called Batdorf and Rodney, who never set the world on fire. But one of these days, I still think that it's going to get the definitive version. Hmm. 
It is absolutely, in my humble opinion anyways, one of the most beautiful songs ever. Oh, well, thank you. That's very kind of you. There's another one that you wrote with Will Jennings, Looks Like We Made It, that is a yep. favorite of a lot of people. Tell us about composing that song. Will, we were, I was back and Will had come over to England. This was back in England and I remember so clearly it was one of those rare, beautiful days where there wasn't a cloud in the sky and Will was, had been put up in some sort of small hotel and he had all the curtains closed. And I kept, kept went and I said, Will, what a, well, it's beautiful outside then. He said, I can't concentrate when all the curtains are open. We sat down and we wrote, looks like we made it that afternoon. Will and I used to write, always used to write the, in my favorite way of writing. And that is where we you both sit together with nothing and I would be fooling around on the keyboard. Will would be just thinking about lyrics, and uh, and we might be in the same room, we might not, but we'd be in the same house or hotel. And he'd hear what I was doing, and I'd hear what he was doing, and he'd say nine times out of ten, he'd say, "I love what you're doing there," and I wouldn't even be aware of what I was doing, and I'd just go over and over and over it again, and he'd say, "Yeah," and 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 we'd write really, really, really write together, as it were, as opposed to so many songs of late where someone will send me a lyric or I will send a melody or we actually write, compose the, the, the song together in the same room. There's been so many songs that you've composed that Barry Manilow has recorded. Why do you think that Barry Manilow has recorded so many of your songs? I know why, Paul, because Clive Davis wanted him to. I think, you know, I was a Clive Davis favorite at the time. It's strange. I didn't really want to get into writing all those ballads. I didn't want to get known for writing all those ballads, although they've been very kind to me, you know. And, of course, having started off with Mandy, which was when Manilow was totally unknown, you know, I know that Barry, I think it's quite right and honest to say Barry never want, wanted to record other people's songs. He only wanted to record his own songs, which is fair enough that he's a, you know, he's a fine songwriter. It was Clive that said, no, you know, you haven't got a single here. This is a song you're going to record. And I, uh, I'm not privy to exactly what went on with Clive and Barry in, in their times together, but I do know that he never wanted to record Mandy in the first place. He never wanted to record Somewhere in the Night or Looks Like We Made It or, or all the other ones. So it's down to Clive. Interesting. Well, one of Manilow's longtime collaborators, the lyricist Marty Panzer, yep. you wrote a song with him. How did you meet Marty Panzer? I'm <laughs> I was lying back, exhausted after having written quite a lot with will and needed to just take a little break and i was in palm springs i was lying back on a, one of those sun lounges soaking up the sun and i heard this name are you richard kerr and i thought who the, f who the hell is this and my eyes were closed i, I didn't have i saw I, I got up and i uh, said yes i am and he said i recognize your photograph uh, my name is Marty Panzer. I said, hello, Marty, really wishing that he'd go away. And uh, he said, I, I'm, I'm a great friend of Barry Manilow's. And I said, oh, well, it's very nice to meet you. And he said, do you think that there's a chance that you and I could write something together one day? And I said, yeah, I mean, let me know or show me one or two lyrics that you've written. I'd love to see whether we can and, and I like Marty's style very much indeed very very much from the heart and we sat down I think we've written maybe six or seven songs a long time ago now he has actually two questions that he asked for us to ask you oh so these two questions are from Marty Panzer Right. As not only one of the most successful songwriters of your generation, but also one of the most well-respected songwriters of your generation, which well, writers... Me? He's speaking of you, yes. Oh. Which writers today are writing at the quality level you respect? Ah, boy. There are a lot. But, you know, I... It's funny, I have, Paul, I have never, and probably to my detriment, but I have never really studied 
the music business, or not the music business, but I've never really been one of those that, who goes out and buys lots of albums when they come out and stuff. But uh, I'd have to say the first first person that comes to my mind today is Adele. And I can't remember the name of the guy that she writes mostly with, but she's a great talent. A lot of the, my other choices, people who are, are not really current, but I mean, I always have loved Don Henley's writing from the Eagles. Yeah. And I mean, there, there are so many people that, that I love. I think that if I sat in front of a chart right now and with a lot of records in front of me, I should have probably prepared for this, but there are so many bands that I don't know the names of the writers to. I heard again recently a new album by Randy Newman. Newman's always been one of my real favorites. But these are all old. I mean, you know, Paul Simon is a great writer. Uh, Jimmy Webb, who I spent a wonderful evening and night with many years ago. He's a great writer. But today, as you're probably only too aware, with, with the exception of a few, the business, music business has changed, you know, 180 degrees. And it's not really songs today. It's more image. It's more production. It's like the film industry in a way. that They sort of parallel one another in that the special effects are so important today in music and in film. And I think to the detriment of the actual story and the meat of the song or the film. Yeah. Well, the second question of the two that Marty wanted me to ask, he says, who's best carrying the torch for well-written, important songs that will last beyond the moment? You just mentioned Adele. What about... Yeah perhaps singers that are singing other people's songs? Who do you think is doing a good job? Well, just, there are just so few. I have lost touch with those singers who... They're tough questions, Marty. Uh, <laughs> I don't know whether the British chart echoes the American chart any longer. I guess I'd have to say that Michael Bublé does a pretty darn good job of other people's songs, but you've really stumped me. It's it's hard to pick out. that I, I can't just pick out a lot of names that come to mind. One of the songs that you wrote is a very well-known song, I'll Never Love This Way Again. What inspired yeah. that? That was Will and I, Will Jennings and I, at my little ranch-style place in Nichols Canyon. I love the names that Los Angeles gives to its roads. I started off in Wonderland Park Avenue. I moved to Astral Drive, and in Astral Drive we wrote that song, and it was one of those songs that had a bit of aftertaste to it, simply because some guy out of New Jersey put a claim that we ripped him off. We'd never heard it his song we'd never met him what happened was that they froze all the because they had to legally the bmi and the record company arista froze all the royalties so we didn't see the royalties from that record for over a year or a year and a half i think but the actual writing of the song was another one with will that came very quickly indeed and i believe that that was a verse lyric first there's another one that you wrote recorded by the late Roy Orbison, in the real oh, world. Yeah. Tell us about that song. What a lovely man. What just you know, I have to just say one thing about Roy, which probably all his closest friends have said and know for themselves. But of all the the stars, so-called stars that I have met during the years, I think I would have to say that Roy was the the one with the least glitter about him. He was such a humble man, you'd never known that he, he had had the sort of career he had. That was written in Will's house in Westlake Village in an afternoon. I remember in the real world came very quickly, and I believe that that was partly lyric first. Yet again, it's the sort of lyric, you see, for me anyhow, that writes itself. And when Roy heard it, Will, I don't know how Will got to know Roy, but it was Will that got to know, know Roy rather than myself. But Roy came round one afternoon, we played him that, and we played him another song, You May Feel Me Crying. He loved both of them and, and actually recorded both of them. One, The second one, You May Feel Me Crying, was, was in a film. It wasn't a hit. Neither was in the real world, but it was on the last album he did. 
What about the song that John Denver recorded, Don't Close Your Eyes Tonight? Oh, yeah. Funny you should say that. I was watching a special, you know, on John Denver just the other day. My wife is a huge fan of John Denver. Yeah, I, it was delightful to have a John Denver record. Again, I don't, it wasn't a big hit, but he was a one of a kind in his style of writing. And, and it's always especially lovely, from my point of view, when a writer... A artist, someone who writes their own songs, records one of your songs. That's a special privilege, I think, because it means that they really, really do value the song and they want to record it for themselves. What about the song In Another World that Manilow recorded? What inspired that? He didn't get it at all. He didn't get I wish I could play the demo. I wrote that with a, a lady named Charlie Daw, and it's one of our favorite songs, but I wasn't happy with Barry Manilow's version of that. That's all I can say about that one. Have you had any interactions with Manilow through the years? Very little. Very little indeed. I think we probably only met on three occasions, and all three at at functions, you know, music business functions. I do remember (laughs) he suggested to me many years ago that we try and write together. And I said, what, you mean you, you, just you and me? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, what's it going to be like? I don't know if you've ever heard of Ferranti and Teicher, have you? I haven't heard of that, no. Oh, okay. Well, they were two guys who sat facing one another, both at their own pianos. And I said, I I can't imagine how we could do that, Barry. So nothing came of of our writing, sitting down and writing together. It might have been interesting, but we'd have probably had to get a a separate lyricist then. Yeah. Well, speaking of lyricists, you've written with the lyricist John Bettis, who you mentioned earlier. Yes. What is it like to write with him? I think John and I had not a bad luck is the wrong word. I just don't think we were lucky. We've written a lot of songs together, and we've had a lot of recordings, a lot of cuts of the songs, but we've never had a big hit together, and we should have done. We started writing, I think it's fair to say, he was, the Carpenters were on the wane, as it were. He had a lot of time on his hands. I again, loved his lyrics. I loved the way his mind worked lyrically. And he's had so much success, just like Will has had way apart from me. I mean, you know the sort of hits that Will has had. And John the same. I mean, I don't know if John's won an Oscar, but Will's won too. John has had tremendous success writing apart from me, but we've written some very fine songs, a lot of the songs that I put on my very unsuccessful own albums, and a nice man and and someone that I think of very fondly. I know this might be a difficult question to answer. With all the lyricists that you've worked with and all of the songwriters you've written with, from Will Jennings to Scott English... Marty Panzer, John Bettis. I believe you told me that you'd written with Paul Williams. Yes, but Paul, I I love dearly. We've written maybe half a dozen songs together, but we were both at difficult times in in each of our lives. Not songs that I, I think, I can only speak for myself, not songs that I'm really proud of. I would have thought that, you know, knowing his sort of writing and my sort of writing, we would have been a match made in heaven. Not something that I can actually say, yes, this song should have been a hit. So we just had our writing times together, but other parts of life took over from our creativity, I think, when we sat down together. Well, on that note, of all of the co-writers you've worked with, could you pick a favorite? No. No. Absolutely not. What (laughs) What about a favorite song of yours? Is that possible? Well, it's funny you say I think... I think probably somewhere in the night. Yeah. I think so. Although the one that's been the best and the kindest to me is Mandy. There are some, I mean, the music business changes, you know, so much. But I think I'm, I know probably most writers would say this about themselves, but I generally think I'm writing better right at this moment in time, at this very moment in time, than, than I ever have. Whether there's the songs I'm writing and have written in the last five years will ever become hits is something else, but I feel a new lease on life, maybe one of those will be turn out to be my favorite of all time. What was it like to have Frank Sinatra record one of your songs? Amazing. Strangest thing is, is you, the song was Blue Eyes, which John Partridge recorded, the busker. Interesting. And the only time, and, I, and this shows you how much 
I don't collect gold records and things like that and hang them up on my wall like so many people do. I, I don't have much interest in that side of it. But I've only ever heard it a couple of times. It was on a, on a Sinatra album, and therefore I felt quite justified to use it in my press handout. But I don't even have a copy of it. Interesting. <laughs> yes. When somebody hears your music, wherever they are, on an elevator, if they're listening to it on an album, however they're listening to it, what do you want the listener to get out of that experience? don't want to sound too self-important here, but I, I'd like them to be moved in some way or another by it. I don't think that's I'm not so very important. good at sitting so I'm not very good at writing songs that are just rhythmic and just bubblegum, the sort of thing that is here today, gone tomorrow. It's hard to explain it. Very, there was one time, I remember, when I was signed to Screen Gems, which is now EMI Publishing, where my publisher said, I will sit down and try and write like so-and-so. Only because he'd asked me to, I thought I would listen to a few of the things that so-and-so had written, and it didn't work for me. It has to come from the heart, even whether it be up-tempo, slow ballad, or mid-tempo, it still has to come from the heart. And I just would like someone to be to say, yeah, that song really means something to me because I could pr put myself in that person's position or in that piece of music. That means something be at that particular time in my life. What is the best thing about being Richard Kerr? Well, I'm still alive. I'm still writing songs. And I'm happily married with a wonderful Welsh terrier who just this afternoon dug through the rabbit poo fencing and caused me no end of strife chasing <laughs> after him over the fields. I came back this afternoon, poor after having finally captured him, and I need, it took me five or ten minutes to actually get my breath back. That's a pretty good life I've got. I always love music. It'll always be my first love above anything, I think. As long as I still have that desire to write, I'm happy. For anyone who's listening to this interview, wherever they are in the world, or if they're reading it, however they experience it, what would you like to say to those people? They're not writers or anything. They're just, just the general public, yeah. All kinds of people. All kinds of people. Do it rather than say it. Mm, sound advice. <laughs> For my last question, yeah. who is Richard Kerr? Richard Kerr is, a, I think, a fairly humble songwriter and someone who's always trying. This sounds so hammy, but there's always someone who's always trying to be just a little better person each day if he can. Well, just imagine if everyone had that mindset, how much further along we'd be. <laughs> <laughs> a part of me would like to say, thank you, Mr. Kerr, out of no, respect. Don't say. But you like to be called Richard. Yes, please. Thank you, Richard. It's been a great pleasure to have this conversation. Well, thank you, Paul. We tried to get together so many times on the phone, and at last we've made it, and thank you very much indeed. I hope I've sort of, it's been semi-interesting. It has been very interesting. It has been a real okay. honor. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, Paul. It's been a pleasure. All right. Farewell. Okay. <laughs>